Hello, everybody. I'm Friedrich Nassens. I'm Director Enterprise Solutions EMEA at Wearscape and your host today. So welcome to today's webinar, Unlocking Data Vaults. Um, just before we start, um, this is a short webinar, half an hour. I don't think we have time for elaborate Q&A at the end, but do not hesitate to write down in uh, the chat or the questions uh, part of, of the control panel, any questions you have. We will always uh, be ready uh, afterwards to uh, respond to any questions by, via email, phone, or personal follow-up. Um, today's webinar is recorded, and you will receive at the end uh, an email with a download link so you can listen to and view the recording again. So, Wearscape. Uh, well, Wearscape is a global company, so we are active in uh, all relevant time zones all over uh, the planet. Uh, we have sales and support uh, organizations in all those relevant time zones. Uh, our software development team is in the far right corner in New Zealand, and our headquarters are in Portland, USA. Um, yeah, automation is global, but who should be using automation? Who is a candidate to use automation? Is it only big companies uh, or new companies that start building data warehouses, infrastructures that can uh, use the benefits of automation or can anybody use it? Well, we think that anybody, big, small, uh, long-term uh, BI initiatives or new BI initiatives can use uh, automation. Um, let me just a focus on uh, one particular uh, of our customers, which is Micron. And uh, until now, they are currently running the biggest data vault in the world, which is using Wearscape to do all the design and uh, loading. But of course, yeah, uh, automation is relevant everywhere where it takes too much time, processes are too slow. Um, and we can automate, we can help automate the boring parts, uh, remove human error. Uh, we don't take away the smart and, and the challenging things that's left to human beings, to you on the call, but we take away all the boring parts and make you look like the most consistent person, uh, employee in the team. Automation, what is that? Is that, uh, just uh, being able to generate some scripts and some tables, hoplink satellites, if we talk about data faults in a database, is that automation? Is that what it's all about? No, because that's typically only yeah, automating parts of your development process here. But automation goes a lot further. Uh, if you're building out data faults, you will be building out uh, hundreds, thousands of objects. So having consistent designs and having automation help you to be consistent at part makes a lot of sense. Also, we work, we are IT people, we work in a development environment, deploy to acceptance and finally release in production. So deployment and then daily operations, keeping the things running in production is very important. And of course, yeah, the last thing in the middle is what probably every IT person yeah, doesn't like is to document uh, or consult documentation, which might be out of date. So all those different areas, those five Ds, those are areas in which we are active. So we have a, a tool suite, we have uh, different modules that work together and provide you with automation in all these different areas. Later in this webinar, in the second part, uh, my colleague Mark will be providing you with an, a sneak preview into our software and he will be showing you a little bit of design automation, development automation and documentation automation. Um, Wearscape is closely linked to DataVault 2.0 and to Dan Linz. Dan Linz, that being the uh, inventor in the 90s of DataVault, has been continuously enhancing uh, the design methodology, that framework, and uh, Wearscape has a close collaboration to provide an ecosystem around that. So to provide you with the five Ds, as I mentioned before, tuned specifically for uh, data vaults. At this moment, I would like to introduce yeah, the company Scalefree. Scalefree is, uh, and Michael from Scalefree as the CEO, they are active in uh, over Europe. They are specializing in 
data vault training, consultancy and projects. Uh, Scale Free is uh, co-founded by Michael and Dan Lindstedt, the inventor of uh, data vault, so it can't get any closer to reality. And uh, Michael will provide you in the next session some insights on what the data vault methodology is all about. Um, yeah, if you look into data vault, you find out well, data vault is all based on, around hubs, links, and satellites. So, if I know those three concepts, do I know everything I need to know, Michael? I think that's where I need to step in. Hello, everybody. Um, I think um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to have a short presentation on data vault to find out what it is. Um, I think that the 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 promise of data vault 2.0 is in the end to build an enterprise data warehouse. Um, that sources all data from all your data sources, uh, integrates the data in the, in the enterprise data warehouse layer, uh, versionizes it, um, and then um, we can turn this raw data into actual information that's a, a usable information in the end uh, that the end, end user can use for their purpose at hand. Um, we can deliver this information to any um, information subscriber, even though there might be internal external with contradicting uh, business requirements. Um, and um, for building such a system, we need a little bit more than just hubs and links and satellites. But the basics um, of the model itself, um, that is, uh, we, um, yeah, the basics essentially that we have uh, the hubs, which is a unique list of business keys, essentially identifying, um, well, the business keys identify the business objects in the, in the enterprise. Then we have the links, uh, the, the relationships between those business keys, for example, the flight. A flight is identified by a, a carrier code, by a flight number, uh, flight dates, the airport codes, the, the origin of the airport code and destination airport code. And then the satellites describe either the business key, tells us what's behind the, um, the some carrier code, what's behind some um, customer number and so on, or some airport code in this case, um, or what's when the flight started, uh, when the customer walked into a um, um, store, for example, or what, what was the retail, well, sorry, transaction price, for example, and so on. So those three basic entities is what, uh, what's the foundation of the model. Um, there's, there's some more special entity types, um, but it's not just the model. In order to build an enterprise data warehouse, we actually need multiple components. Um, we need the modeling part and on the bottom. Um, again, it's a, it's a very, very flexible model that we can easily uh, essentially extend over time. That's uh, very nice for essentially an agile uh, methodology. It's very scalable. It can scale up to uh, petabytes of data. Um, we can process the data in real time in batch mode. Um, in the end, the model, if you don't know that yet, um, has been essentially derived from nature. So then tried out, um, essentially, um, yeah, he, he researched it and derived the, the actual model from nature. That's the short, the short, um, the short explanation. Um, because you can easily extend it over time, uh, sprint by sprint, essentially. We use an agile methodology at the top, um, essentially based on consistent, repeatable patterns. Um, every sprint looks very similar. Based on that, we can uh, essentially um, improve the development processes over time. Uh, we use that in a um, yeah, in a um, continuous improvement process, essentially. And then the architecture component of that of Data 2.0 uh, is a multi-tier architecture, highly scalable, can scale um, across multiple environments. Uh, for example, you could have some data on uh, on premise, let's say an uh, on premise database, relational database. You might have some IoT streams in the cloud, in some cloud database. There might be a Hadoop cluster somewhere else, either in the cloud or on premise. You might uh, distribute the, your data warehouse across multiple regions. You might have some data is stored in uh, Switzerland, some other data in Europe um, or in, in the Eurozone. Um, and then you might have um, other organization reasons to separate data sets. You might have a general enterprise data was for a general population, your general users, and then you have another, let's say, compliance data set, compliance data warehouse where uh, only compliance has, has access to even physically uh, separated essentially. Um, and it supports, um, well, based on the fact that uh, Data Vault uh, was used to essentially implement big data solutions back then in the 90s. Um, it was the first, one of the first installations was essentially a data warehouse that uh, processed three petabytes of data in the 90s. They already had a big data problem without having the term being coined. Um, it follows very similar or exact, essentially the same principles as in, for example, Apache Hadoop or other big data technologies. 
So like like Schema on Re, for example. Um, so it's 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 designed in a way that that it works very well with other NoSQL approaches, Apache, uh, Hadoop, for example, or other document stores, JSON document stores, and so on. Part of the methodology is the implementation patterns. The implementation patterns are again based on the fact that um, in Data Vault in the model we see a lot of repeating patterns. All the hubs look very similar. All the links look very similar. All the satellites look very similar. Um, based on that, these patterns, the loading patterns, how we load hubs, links, satellites, even these loading patterns are, are very uh, similar, which means that um, we can, th there's, a, there's a good opportunity here for automating these loading patterns, even the model, the, the model generation, and that speeds up the methodology. It, it increases the agility of your teams. You become more productive, essentially, which means that when you, let's say, we're able to produce 10, uh, raw data vault entities in a sprint, in a four-week sprint, uh, just to come up with a number, you might come up with hundreds or two hundreds of entities in a sprint with a dedicated team that knows the tool, that knows the concept, knows what to do in the century. Um, the, um, so and that's, the, that's the basic idea of the, the methodology and the relationship to the implementation patterns. Um, the methodology itself, as I said, is, is as well based on standardized repeatable, repeatable patterns, which allow a consistent development stream um, essentially, what we want to do is we want to end up with a information factory, if you want, where a new requirement comes in uh, for a new report or a new dashboard or some API for some um, interface, maybe, to another application. Um, and then everybody knows what to do. Everybody works on this pattern, um, essentially runs data through the layers, into, applies the business logic, and then uh, creates the report, essentially. Um, and that's where a tool like uh, Wearscape comes into play as well. As I said, the reference architecture, um, that's essentially um, uh, straight from the book that we wrote. The, um, it essentially allows the extension of uh, components across multiple environments. Uh, again, you might have some data locally, some data in the cloud. Um, it's a hybrid architecture that spans into multiple environments, but also into multiple technologies. Some data might be good to be stored in a relational database. Um, some data might be a better fit to store on a, on a, a NoSQL database, on a JSON store, on a, on a file system, maybe not like uh, this would be faster like HDFS. Um, it's all data vault, data vault itself has been developed on MPP systems, on massively parallel processing clusters, where um, we have thousands of nodes storing the data, but also processing the data. Um, but it also works on single node systems. So there's no reason to, to not use data vault on a single node system. And the architecture has an interesting concept um, that we call managed self-service BI, where we, as, as the data warehouse team, we create the platform, the data platform. We set up all the tools, um, all the dashboarding tools, the automation tools, and so on. And um, the, um, it, but also we are providing the raw data, for example, integrate the raw data, versionize the raw data, and then make it available to, to the power users. Um, so they can create their own solutions in this platform based on this um, uh, on this integrated raw data. They even might write back data into the enterprise data warehouse. Don't get confused. I'm an IT guy. I'm a computer scientist from, from my academic background, from my personal background. My neck hair goes up when I hear that somebody writes back data into my enterprise data warehouse, but there's a provisioning for that. So they will not write back into our IT-driven data warehouse area, essentially. But they get a user space where they can write back data. And that helps them to design their own solutions when, uh, let's say, your organization, your data warehouse organization is limited in resources, is limited in, in timings. Uh, it might be not budget-wise, but the question is how many consultants do you have on site, but it might be also budget, right? So, um, but on the other hand, the powers have the desire and the need to have, they need solutions, that's the point. And um, yeah, so that's that's the basic idea. Um, the, but it also, we, we can also, from an IT perspective, we can also provide standard solutions, right? So there's no reason to not producing a end-to-end -end solution from an IT side. Um, the general data workflow, how we work in a data world 2.0 project, essentially we have some sourcing process. We load the data from the source system, either into a relational staging area or into a data lake. Um, from there, we load the data, we, well, we break it up into small pieces. I like to compare this with, um, a, let's say, Lego bricks, where you take a model, break it apart, um, and then you can, once you have these hubs and satellites, you have small bricks, you can put them together into any target model you want. That's the interesting part. And um, 
that's done using very simple ETL. The sourcing process is very simple from ETL perspective, all metadata driven, and the warehousing part as well. Once we have the small bricks, uh, the HubSync satellites, we can then apply business logic, enterprise business rules, um, in order to interpret the data, transform the raw data into more useful information, and then essentially apply a target schema on this, the data vault model to make the data vault model look like or appear as a star schema, a snowflake schema, a flat and white table, a true NF uh, NED, or something else, whatever you want. And then we can use the dashboarding tool to present the, tool, to present the information or some other uh, reporting tool or some or load into a uh, subsequent application and so on. So that's the general workflow of um, building a data vault 2.0 um, model. And there's a lot of opportunities here for automation essentially. Thank you, Michael. Um, just to highlight, if you're interested and not completely knowledgeable about Data Vault yet, uh, do not hesitate uh, to uh, look into uh, buying the book written by, uh, co-written by Michael and Dan Lindstedt, or follow it, uh, one of the trainings, skill-free trainings. The complete Wearscape EMEA team has been trained by either Michael or uh, Dan uh, over the last year. Um, yeah, so it's demo time, um, of course. 15 minutes left, we can only give you a small sneak preview. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do uh, what you would do in a project. We start at the beginning. So what we will do is, um, yeah, discover, find out what kind of data is available, source it, and then build a raw data vault on top of it. And actually, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, it's going to be done by my uh, colleague, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark van der Heijden, uh, who lives in Holland. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, yes, yeah, so let's just jump right in, and because um, I don't want to waste any time, so let's see if I can take over the screen. You should all be able to see it, hopefully. Um, all right. So, Wearscape. There are two modules, and I will show both of them briefly. Um, as Explained by Fred and uh, and by Mike, um, you need to you need to have the the workflow present um, for designing and and discovering your source data. So that's what our first module does. Wearscape 3D is specialized in in discovering these source systems. And for this demo, we have a connection to the Northwind demo database, and I will just do a very quick discovery of that. So I'll make a new version for a, a source model, sales model, select my schema, and I only want to have tables discovered, not views. I'm not interested in views. And I need to set that this is, in fact, a SQL Server database. And now I can have a full discovery. So it's now actually scanning the metadata of the source system. This can be SQL Server database, any other type of database that we can connect to with JDBC or ODBC, uh, or files on HDFS or on a Linux or Windows file server. Um, so the discovery is already done. I will run some profiling as well, which will analyze the data or part of the data, if it's a lot, um, to give you some characteristics that you can use later on. OK, so this is a perfect source system, right? We have primary keys, we have foreign keys with nice relationships, and this is all derived directly from the database. But of course, if you work with a typical source system or even with flat files, you don't get all of this metadata. A lot of, a lot of database systems don't come with primary keys or foreign key relationships defined. So we need to, um, actually we have two of those tables here suppliers and categories. They should be part of the model, but you can see that there are no relationships. So Wearscape can help you in this area um, by deriving the foreign key joins. So there's just a simple wizard. You can set a whole lot of options. I will just skip over all of that and go right in. And you can already see the two missing relationships, categories to products and suppliers to products. So it has found those. And I can simply um, use the wizard to, to make those relationships. And we can refine that as well. 
if you would like, you can also make your own relationships. So I could choose to make this connection um, and simply make a relationship like that. So you can you can have it uh, done automatically. You can have it derived. You can use profiling information um, just to get to know the source system because this is very important. You need to know what data you're looking at, what what kind of model you're working on, um, but also what the data looks like. So you can even query the source system from here as well. Right. So once you've discovered all of your source systems, the next step would be to create um, a logical model or business model, or however, however you like to call it. Um, and you can do this in two ways. You can, of course, build a logical model from scratch, as you should do, completely independent from any source system, um, and then add a mapping to your source systems to it. Um, or you can use um, a, a source model as a, uh, as a starting point, which would be the data-driven way. Um, to, um, to just then only assign the business keys for your data vault. So over here, I've got an example logical model. Um, this is not modeled exactly like the support system. And you can see that this third column here, for example, on the order details, you can see which um, source tables are used. So over here, we are actually using five source tables. We're taking the order ID from the orders table, we're taking the product name, which is the business key for a product, which we can see here. The product entity has product name with a little red box. So this is our business key. The red boxes indicate a business key. Um, the blue boxes are the data vault concept of a unit of work, um, which essentially means that they, the, these business um, um, entities work together um, as a unit. And in the end, we will see that in the data vault model, they will come back as link entities. Um, and you can describe multiple types of attributes. So maybe on volatility, or what we see a lot is personally identifiable information. So you need to go over your entire logical model to basically map them to the sources. Uh, only one source system for this demonstration, but you can have un basically unlimited sources mapped onto this logical model. Um, and you need to flag the additional attribute types. So on this one, we have no types yet, so I will just add them manually. So the shipper name, that would be my business key, and the phone number would be a low volatility attribute. So that's very simple like that. Now you can see the boxes are there. So I've finished my logical model. Um, and essentially, when this is done, we can go to the next step, which is apply the whole development pattern that is described in the uh, in the data vault book. Um, what to do with business keys, what to do with units of work, what to do with all of these types of attributes that we have over here. There's a standard, and the standard is now part of our uh, Wearscape product suite. So we can make an advanced copy um, of this logical model and actually build a raw vault. So I'm going to create a copy of this logical model and apply model conversions. So I'm going to apply a lot of rules, just using the default. So there's different types of data vault models you can build. This one uses the data vault 2.0 standard way, which uses um, hash keys. And you can already see here, there's a lot of hubs and links and satellites built automatically. So here's the hub employee with actually three satellites. So the attributes are split on uh, um, volatility, so the, the rate of change. So the low rate of change attributes are over here. There's a lot of metadata generated as well. Um, but this is still just a model, OK? And this is actually still mapped to our logical model. So it's not even, it's not even mapped to the source yet. Um, so this is the, the warehousing part of the workflow that Mike described earlier. Um, but we also need the sourcing part because we need to get the data from the source systems and prepare that in our staging area. 
to, for example, calculate the hash keys, the change hashes, um, the, the version numbers and other metadata. This all has, has to be uh, calculated. So we need something on top of this raw vault model um, that will uh, that will help us to to extract the data from the source system and load it into our platform, our target platform, which can be anything, can be cloud, can be a local database, um, any almost any type of database. Um, and once that's loaded and staged, we can load it into this raw vault model. So we need to do another model conversion to create a, a deployment model, and that I've already prepared one for time purposes. Um, so this is it. Still the same data vault model. It's just one model conversion rule that we're running, um, which will add, over here you can see it, it will add stage tables, load tables. And, um, and then if we go, for example, we go to our link order detail here. So this is the link that joins the orders, the products, the customers, and the employees all together with the order line number as a special unique identifier for the order details. We can now have a look at the table source, see where this table is coming from. So this here, this is our Northwind source database. We've got order details, products, etc. These five source entities, they need to be loaded. So they go over here. Each of them has one load table which is an exact one-to-one -one copy of the source data or maybe a delta you can add that logic as well if you like and then we join all five together in a stage table to make a calculation of all the hash keys that we need and all the other stuff and finally we go from the stage table to a link here so right now we have a completely um, mapped metadata based model which is actually um, system independent and we can deploy this to um, to our development environment where we will turn this this model um, this metadata into a physical structure and this development environment can then also generate the necessary code um, to actually populate the entities so again in terms of um, limited time i have prepared that for you. So we jump into our next product, which is Rarescape Red. This is the development environment. So this is where you actually add the, the business logic, the complexities, uh, transformations, etc. You can actually build everything you want directly in here. Um, but Rarescape 3D is the um, metadata automation tool, the model driven tool to help you um, do all the work that's repeatable, that's pattern-based for you. So this is very um, useful for um, for a data vault concept. And actually, you can see that Wearscape Three D created two folders for us. The raw vault is over here, and we have our hubs, links, and satellites all in here. Um, the deployment process that we run in between when going from 3D into red already creates all the entities for us on the target platform. And that includes all the load tables to get the data from the sources, stage tables as well. And um, um, we can now actually um, load the data as well. Uh, code has been generated. So if we look at this stage table for a customer, can see again that there's a hash key in here there are change hashes uh, we can have a look at the data i've already loaded it so we can see the hash keys here they're looking a bit strange but it's an md5 hash and all the uh, actual data is there including the metadata like the record source coming from this database name schema name table name in the source system so that's the data loaded, um, but what does the code look like? So Wearscape is a, it's not an ETL tool, it's an ELT tool. So there is no ETL engine. We just build native code for your target platform. So if you have a multi-target, multi-tire um, 
data warehouse platform, every target will get its own bespoke code generated, whether it's um, a stored procedure or just a simple insert select statement. Um, you can use uh, PowerShell scripts, Linux scripts, Windows scripts, actually any type of script that you want. Um, and over here, you can see that we use a standardized MD5 function. And this is all based on open templates. So you can customize um, the, the hashing functions uh, one time, and then all the code will be generated with that standard that you've decided. So everything is um, customizable by you. And not only these little things like hashing, but everything. So the entire code that's generated from start to finish, even the logging here, all the messages, everything can be changed to your liking. Right. So now we have, we actually did some sourcing. We did warehousing. Um, if you look at the uh, the five Ds of automation, we have done design. So we've, we, we've created a logical model. We've done development, most of it, at least for the raw vault. We can now continue to build business vault objects, et cetera. Um, we need some documentation as well. And normally this is a very tedious thing and, and documentation is outdated before it's finished. Um, but in Wearscape, because we can generate code, we can also generate documentation, obviously, because of the, the metadata um, base that's under there. So I've done that for you. It's just one button. It will take the metadata and generate a web page, essentially. Um, as an example here, we have our raw vault. And I can now have a look at that link order detail again. And this shows us all of the details the relationships that we have with the order detail transaction satellites and the four hubs that we know by now. Um, the columns are explained in here. And just to be clear, this is technical documentation. There's also um, a user-friendly uh, business documentation, which shows you a lot less technical details. Um, but in this case, the technical documentation gives you exactly how the link hash key is built, what the uh, sources are for the hub hash keys, um, it gives you the lineage diagram again. So we, I showed it in 3D and the logical model as well. But here it's physicalized. So you can see that there are five source tables which are going into each separate load table and then joined together into a stage table loaded into the link. And um, you can have a look at the generated code in here as well. The spine diagram is here. So the entire data vault model, you can see that here without the satellites, obviously, because it's a spine. Uh, any indexes that have been automatically generated by Wearscape, um, joins um, types of um, um, updates or inserts, you're doing hints that you're, you're, you have, you can add all of that, you can see all of it in here. So that's the documentation done. That was another D, I think that's the, the third D. Um, deployment, there's no time to show you, but um, deployments are very easy and automatable. It deploys the code and all the metadata. The objects are created or changed as you configure what to be done. Um, and then finally, there's the thing that's called daily ops, so the operations. We want to have this data vault loaded daily with new data. So there's a scheduler component built into Airscape. Um, it's right here. So you just simply define a job, and this job holds the tasks, so all the load tables and the stage tables, and all the hubs and links and satellites. It holds all of those, and then you can simply run the job, and it logs everything also into metadata, so you can build your own dashboards on top of this metadata as well. Um, you can also control this whole scheduler using the API that we supply. And you can see all the results here. There's a lot of records being loaded. And it only took a few seconds. In fact, it only took two seconds to load this entire data vault model. Okay, there's not a lot of records, but still, it's only a virtual machine. Um, so this, I think, was the, um, the last D. So I've actually shown you the five Ds that Wearscape supports the entire life cycle of um, a data warehouse is supported, is automatable um, as much as you like it to be.
Um, and with that, I think it's uh, time to end. Thank you for, uh, for listening and uh, back to you, Frederick. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, just, uh, just giving you some data points because we're all about automation data points. Uh, um, Mark created uh, a logical model on top of uh, nine entities, 60 attributes. And if you're doing data vault, well, one thing is sure, you will end up at lots of tables. So that nine entities to just create a minimal data vault turned into 22. And if you want to create a full model with uh, source, load, stage, and then the data vault, it turned into 39. So actually what Mark was showing you was third the development uh, of 39 entities, 386 um, attributes all in a few minutes. So uh, it's important. That's uh, 39 entities, Hublink satellites that need design automation. They all need to have the same uh, technical columns and that's what we provide. Yeah, deciding what makes a good business key, all up to you. Um, but then based on your choice of business key, generating all the repeatable boring code, that's what we bring to the table. So yeah, thank you for that, uh, Mark. Um, that's it. Um, I would like to uh, to thank uh, everybody for joining. Um, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we will make sure if they are specific about data vault to have uh, our skill free uh, partner uh, answer those. Uh, the, record, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link later on. So if we got you curious, but you have lots of questions left, just reach out and we will give you an one hour and a half full on demo Thank you for uh, spending your lunch time with us. So until next time, thank you.